everyone, and welcome to Southridge. My name is Kelsey, and I'm actually a student over at Western in London, so I have to take in this service from afar, so I know that sometimes it can be a little bit awkward in this online format. But if this is your first time joining us, I want to offer a couple tips to make the most out of this experience. First, be sure to crank up the volume during the music and sing along. And musicians, download the music charts in the video below and grab your instrument and play along too. If English isn't your first language or you experience hearing, cha hearing challenges, we encourage you to turn on the closed captioning for the video or download the transcripts of the morning's message. And also, be sure to download the Southridge app. This is the latest way to stay connected and informed on everything that's going on here at Planet Southridge. It's completely free and super easy to use. Now, one extra detail for today. A little later on in the service, we will be celebrating communion, as some call it the Lord's Supper. If you want to participate with us, you'll have to have something to eat or drink. Now, it, it can be anything. Ideally, some kind of bread or cracker and anything to drink like juice or tea or even tap water. If you need a moment to grab those things now, go ahead and pause the video while you do that. So as we begin our time together, wherever and whenever you are, if you've been around for the f like forever or if this is your very first time, we hope that for the next hour you feel like you're among friends. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Well, as we enter into our time of worship for today, I want to just invite us to together just quiet ourselves for a couple moments. And so I'm actually going to ask you to just take a big, deep breath in, just like this. Just hold it for a moment, and then slowly breathe out. Feels great, doesn't it? Let's do it again. Just breathe in, and slowly breathe out. You know, the funny thing about breathing is it's something that we do continually. Every moment that you and I have been alive, uh, we've always been breathing the entire time. It's something we do without even thinking. And in similar ways, the presence of God is something that exists all around us, whether we're aware of it or not, both geographically, but also emotionally and spiritually. And so as we get ready to worship through our singing and through our praying and reading of scripture and learning together, what I want you to do is, so that we can better focus on the presence of God, I want to invite you to consider what's the prayer that you want to pray throughout your time uh, as we gather in this way. And that could be a prayer of thanksgiving, of praise. It could be a prayer where you're asking God for something, but so that we can become better attuned to the work that God is doing in us, I want you to think about a prayer that you could be praying uh, throughout this time. And I don't want it to be long. I don't want it to be, you know, a couple sentences or using, you know, long and flowery language. I actually want you to distill it to one word that can just help us to center ourselves. And so just take a couple minutes and think about what's the prayer that you want to pray to God this morning and what would the word be that you would use to summarize that. Now, whatever your word may be, whatever you've chosen, I'm going to invite you to just hold on to that word throughout our time together and just come back to it as we enter into this time of worship. Still I'll be singing 
A diverse community of imperfect people who see the church as less of something to go to and more of a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continually growing in what it means to love one another, fighting for unity rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus, serving those in need and those on the margins. 
knowing that friendship truly makes the difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong, we invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us. We invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hey there, my name's Rick, and I serve as a location pastor here at Southridge. Uh, we're so glad that you're participating with us, and we hope this has already been a meaningful time for you. So I'm here in our Vineland location, and if you've never joined us for one of our in-person gatherings at our Southridge locations, we would love to have you consider joining us in person when you feel ready and able. While we're so grateful to have this online platform to share in this experience from wherever and whenever we find ourselves, we would love even more to have you gather with us in community. In fact, if you do come out, please come say hi to me or one of our many welcoming volunteers. And, and we'd love to get a small gift into your hands just as a way of showing our appreciation for taking the time to come and meet us in person. And as even more of an incentive, we'd actually have these monthly welcome lunches for anyone who's looking to learn more about our community and wanting to connect with folks over some delicious food. Just check out our events page on our website and see when the upcoming welcome lunch is happening. We'd love to have you here. If for whatever reason you're not able to or not comfortable with joining us in person, please know that actually doesn't in any way exclude you from participating in community with us. If you need to touch base with a pastor for any reason, please simply fill out the connect cards. We'd love to hear from you. For those of us who call this community home, one of the ways we practice togetherness and express our gratitude to God and generosity to others is by regular financial contributions. This is one of the ways in which we can invest our lives in what God is doing in and through our church family, making a difference by meeting needs among us across our region and around the world. All of our online giving options are available on our website. And so if you're able to give this week, we invite you to do so in the spirit of joy and generosity. And we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. That's it from me, and now we're gonna hear this week's talk together. And as we do, I invite you to remove as many distractions as possible and listen into what God might be wanting to say uniquely to you. I wanna start by asking you a question, and I don't want you to overthink it. Just give me your quick gut reaction, okay? When you look at the world around you, do you think things are generally getting better or worse? Just your quick reaction, okay? At all our locations, and even if you're watching online, hands up if you think things are generally getting better, okay? And now hands up if you think things are kind of sliding downhill. Okay, well, it's probably a, a bit of a split reaction, so who's right? Well, the, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, it's actually kind of a trick question. See, I wasn't trying to gain any kind of understanding about the nature of our world. I was actually trying to uncover something about the nature of our worldview. You know, what, how you answer the question says about you. It's kind of like a Rorschach test, you know, ink blots. Have you ever seen these? You know, what do you see when you look at these images? See anything at all? That last one is definitely a scary elephant, right? You know, what we see when we look at the world, it actually says something about us. You know, for example, like in this case, uh, whether we're kind of optimistic about things or whether we generally tend to be a bit more pessimistic. Now, of course, one question can't tell the whole story about you, but whether you've considered it or could put it into words, each of us has a worldview. Uh, an underlying lens through which we see, experience, and interpret everything. You know, it, it exists at a level deeper than even our beliefs. It's our perception of reality. You know, it's more like our gut than our mind. And it governs everything about how we live, what we value and what we detest, how we understand right and wrong. 
It informs everything about how we think about everything from politics and ethics to money and morality to friendship, family, and even faith. Now, our worldview isn't genetically hardwired into us from birth. Uh, it's shaped as we develop, formed by things like our family of origin or cultural influences, major world events and life experiences, even the songs, symbols, and stories that begin to seep into our sense of identity. As we get older, you know, outside of some uh, really, truly life-changing experience or significant intentionality, our, our worldview tends to pretty much stay the same, acting more like a, an echo chamber, you know, reinforcing itself by interpreting all new incoming data, all information and experiences through the lens that we already have. Spoiler alert, that's why all your social media rants aren't changing your friends' minds and why theirs aren't changing yours. You know, for the last two months, we've been asking what it looks like to live in the bullseye of a Jesus-centered life, to build our lives around following Jesus rather than simply functioning within a fixed religious framework. Essentially, we've been deconstructing what it means to be Christian in an attempt to reconstruct what it looks like to follow Jesus. Now, trying to move beyond uh, the, the fixed, overly simplistic, black and white, in, out thinking, what we've been calling bounded set thinking, in favor of a more Jesus-centered approach to how we view everything from the Bible to sin and salvation to faith, God's will, and even building community. Basically, we've been taking a brick-by-brick -brick approach to building a Jesus-centered worldview, drilling deep down into our understanding of the Bible in order to clarify the very foundation of our faith. We've been challenging some long-held assumptions and ideas in order to emerge with a pure and simple devotion to the person of Jesus. As we've been doing this hard but important work of rebooting and reprogramming each of our own individual worldviews to become more Jesus-centered, the question that remains for us as we wrap up the series is, what was Jesus' worldview? Well, to start, just like we did with the series, Jesus' worldview was shaped by Scripture. But as Jeff Lockyer reminded us in week one, Jesus didn't view Scripture as some uh, rigid and restrictive set of religious rules to be followed but as a living, divinely inspired narrative intended to center us on the bullseye of God's heart. His worldview was anchored in God's original design for humanity, uh, found on the very first page of the Bible, where we read, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, God created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. God saw all that he had made and said it was very good. Jesus saw the world as God's good creation and the glory of God reflected in the very goodness of humanity, God's image bearers. But he also recognized the corrupting influence of sin. As Jeff Martins reminded us on week two, Jesus saw the human condition and how we, as the Apostle Paul wrote, fall short of the glory of God, missing the mark or bullseye of a life of love. And seeing how generations of laws and leaders, prophets and priests, uh, sermons and sacrifices had failed to move humanity any closer to the bullseye of the glory of God. Jesus got, as John Hand reminded us on week three, that no simple, single, one-time decision uh, can actually remedy the issue. Salvation is a moment-by-moment -moment lifestyle of what the Bible calls faithful devotion to the Lord. That devotion or faith, as Mandy Casper reminded us on week four, isn't some small, safe, static set of beliefs to be mastered but an invitation to enter humbly and honestly into the exciting expanse of mystery of God. A mystery that can't reduce God's will down to some, you know, pre-scripted, carefully controlled plan that we're supposed to robotically follow, 
but an invitation into a wide open, liberating life of collaborating with Jesus to act and to will according to God's good purpose. A purpose that gets lived out in a community called the church. Not some gatekeeping, finger wagging cult of conformity, but a community that, as Leanne Friesen told us last week, uh, exists to encourage one another, to spur one another on towards the bullseye of a life of love. Everything Jesus did and taught flowed from this worldview. And as people were exposed to his unique perception of reality, they were astonished and amazed, saying we'd never heard anything like this. See, their worldview had been formed primarily by the religious leaders of their day, the Pharisees. Now, if you're new to the story of Jesus, the Pharisees are basically the primary antagonists in the stories of the gospel. And as such, they've earned a pretty bad reputation, but they weren't just bad people. Their worldview had been shaped by their own context and history, specifically the stories of how generations of God's people had been exiled from their homeland, Israel, and held in captivity by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and by Jesus' time, the occupying forces of the Roman Empire. Israel had suffered immensely, and they saw that suffering as God's judgment for their spiritual failure. The Pharisees figured, if we can get everybody to fall back in line, maybe the suffering and punishment will end. And so they enforced a strict religious adherence and exercised suffocating spiritual control over people to get everybody back inside the boundaries. And for good measure, they built a wall around the boundaries and fences around the wall. Over time, this boundary set way of thinking became so entrenched in them that that their identity became all about preserving the purity of their religion. Jesus entered into their world with a view that threatened to disrupt everything that they'd built. See, instead of uh, maintaining their biblical interpretations, Jesus opened people's minds to new ideas and insights. Instead of uh, reinforcing and upholding their traditions and customs, Jesus publicly and purposely flouted them. Rather than reaffirming all the old commandments, Jesus had the audacity to give, you, give them a new one. You know, instead of polishing and preserving the boundaries, Jesus toppled their walls, tore down their fences, and rejected their restrictions. Rather than coming alongside them as ambassadors of, of religious preservation, Jesus emerged as an agent of spiritual progress. And nowhere is this seen more clearly than in a story Jesus told about a king representing God who gave some of his servants money to invest on his behalf. The first servant returned with a thousand percent profit and the king responded by saying, well done, good and faithful servant. The second servant returned with 500% profit and got a similar response. But the third servant, the focal character of the story, he returns saying, Lord, I have successfully preserved the money you gave me. I wrapped it up in a napkin and I hid it away because I was afraid of you. Can you guess how the king responded to that servant? He calls him wicked and describes the investment in him as having been worthless. Friends, I want us to consider as the parable intends how we too let fear keep us in a state of just preserving what God has entrusted to us. Instead of investing in growing God's kingdom, how we hide away, you know, play it safe uh, because we're afraid we might get it wrong. How many of us are actually out there actively working to earn kingdom income for our king? You know, not material wealth like in the story, but a prophet of spiritual progress, moving God's kingdom project forward. Now, if you've been reading through the Gospel of Mark with us over the last couple of months, uh, you've seen it's a pretty action-packed story. Like Jesus is on the move, uh, enlisting new recruits, uh, announcing the heaven's Im- imminent arrival on earth. He's healing diseases, forgiving sins, pushing back against spiritual dark forces, reimagining our understanding of God, uh, extending the table of welcome to the previously excluded. 
He touches the untouchable, feeds the hungry, befriends the outcast, and commissions his apprentices to go and do the same. He exercises dominion over creation, overrides the laws of nature, and upends the social order. He describes the kingdom of God as a plant that grows, a loaf of bread that rises, a vineyard that yields a great harvest. He's constantly pointing forward, whether that's predicting his death, promising resurrection, or prophesying the coming destruction of the Jewish temple, which was the symbolic center of the previous era. If nothing else, Jesus emerges as a person of progress, as a disruptive agent of change, unsettling those who would seek to treat God like a fossil you dig up and put on display in a museum. Jesus is more interested in forging the future than preserving the past. He's on offense, not defense. And he invites his followers, us, to join in. What's wild is that in the years since, the church has often reflected more the heart of the Pharisees, you know, emphasizing the boundaries, preserving traditional views and values, stemming the flow of progress. Church, when did we decide that we were going to be the brake pedal of history? When Jesus had his foot so firmly pressed down on the gas. You know, I think like the Pharisees or like the third servant in the story, it's not that we're bad people. I think we're just maybe afraid, afraid to risk, afraid of change, afraid of the unknown, afraid to mess up or, or get it wrong, afraid to incur God's judgment. And so we revert back. We camp out on the old, safe and familiar, you know, finding our identity and being defenders of the faith as if God needed protectors rather than partners in reshaping the world. You know, this fear-based preservationist thinking, it creeps into other areas of our life as well. And you see it in the cult of youth, how we obsess over preserving our youthful looks rather than embracing the natural progression towards maturity and wisdom. We see it in how we idealize the early stages of romantic love, you know, bailing on any relationship that has the audacity to advance past the honeymoon stage rather than celebrating the, the beauty of relationships that have ventured beyond the shallow waters of infatuation into the deep blue sea of a love that has weathered storms and sustained through struggle and change. If you are a parent or a caregiver to young children, we see it in how we try to freeze things, you know, keep them from growing up too fast, try to preserve their innocence and keep them unspoiled from outside influences. And while those instincts are natural and even good, we can be so focused on preserving their innocence that we forget to guide their progress towards maturity. And when our kids do get older, you know, many parents have a hard time learning to relate differently to adult children because change in progress is uncomfortable and scary. I think we see it in our spiritual lives as well. You know, maybe you had a, a really great start to your spiritual journey. Uh, maybe you had a, a great Sunday school teacher or youth group or a life-changing missions trip or summer camp. You know, those spiritual highs, those mountaintop experiences can be really powerful, especially in the early stages of our spiritual development. But some of us never seem to mature beyond them, only to discover far too late that Sunday school answers and summer camp highs can't sustain us through the valleys of life where a lot of the real growth happens. We need to move beyond spiritual adolescence to become mature, faithful followers of Jesus and committed contributors to his church. And some of you have done that. In your adult life, you've actually experienced amazing experiences uh, with God, either here at Southridge or maybe somewhere you were previously. But since then, things have changed. You know, when, when we've experienced God in powerful ways at some point in our life, it can become really tempting to want to hold on and preserve those same methods. You know, we can become resistant to change become immovable and unmoved, unable to see the beauty in a new way for a new season. And folks, I get it. You know, the ways God worked in the past were great. That was a little Tony the Tiger maybe, but the ways God worked in the past was great, but that's not necessarily the way God is moving in the present. 
You know, the, the, the Bible is filled with stories of people who expected God to move in familiar ways they'd previously experienced, only to miss what God did next. To them, God says, like he did through the prophet Isaiah, do not call to mind the former things or consider the things of the past. Behold, I'm going to do something new. Now, that's not to say that everything that's behind us is bad or that all traditions are worthless. We stand on the shoulders of spiritual giants who have handed down to us a treasure trove of well-worn pathways, practices, and traditions that have sustained people of faith for centuries, many of which we're learning to incorporate into our context. You know, we would ignore the past to our peril. But we need to evaluate our traditions, not based on our preferences, but how they are continually shaping a greater degree of Christ-likeness in us. Uh, similarly, I'm not trying to suggest that all change is positive. You know, we live in a time when every single new idea immediately becomes the universally adopted new normal. And uh, if you can't get with the program, you're either a dinosaur or maybe a bigot. Our world is changing faster than it ever has in history, and we need wisdom in this age, perhaps like never before, to be able to see that not all movement is progress. But all progress requires movement. We can't stand still. See, the kind of movement and progress we're talking about, it's the kind of change that gets us closer to Christ-likeness. That's what we mean by spiritual progress. Because the church of Jesus is a movement, not a museum. Our mission isn't to sit still until Jesus comes back for us, or, or worse, to move things backward to some misguided idea of the good old days. Our mission, our calling, is to be God's agents of restoration in the world, energized by the Holy Spirit, to fulfill, finally, that creation mandate that God gave us at the beginning, the one we read earlier, you know, to be fruitful and multiply. And to be clear, that's not just talking about procreation. It's talking about progressing the work of creation, to create to improve, to spark beauty, truth, and goodness in our world, to advance God's kingdom through compassion and innovation, justice and joy, widening the welcome and spreading wisdom and love, to remake the world according to the glory of God and carry the human story from the garden of God in Genesis to the shining city of God at the end of Revelation. You know, 20 years ago, I lived in Calgary, Alberta. I was working as a young pastor at a brand new church, and I'll never forget this one workshop I went to for church leaders. It was put on by two guys from Australia. You know, they'd landed at the airport in Calgary and had driven out to our meeting spot, beautiful spot, you know, in the, in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains. And as they introduced themselves, they described their drive out, you know, as they winded through the vast Alberta farmland. And they asked a question, they asked, you know, why do Canadian farmers build these extensive fences around their farms? It must be so expensive. Well, someone in our group who knew the answer said, well, it keeps the livestock from wandering off their property onto someone else's farm. You know, the fences keep everything where it's supposed to be. I'll never get, forget their reaction. In Australia, they said, our farmers don't build fences. They dig wells at the center of their property. It's the animals will never wander far from a reliable source of water. They know that it's what keeps them alive. Folks, do we know what keeps us alive spiritually? Because it's sure not the fences that we build to keep everything where it belongs. Those fences, far from keeping us alive, are actually keeping us from the life that God created us for. A life that can only be found in the well at the center, where the living water flows and never runs dry. The very source of life itself, Jesus. Around here, we see the church as a community of people who hang out at the well. A subversive society within society who harness the presence of Jesus to turn graves into gardens, turn mourning into dancing, dry deserts of depression into rivers of joy who, with kindness and compassion, push back against selfishness and greed. It's not some static or stagnant thing. It's a movement. It's about growth. That's why we're not the church we were a decade ago. 
and why we're not the church we're going to be a decade from now. See, I believe we've always been at our best here when we're taking the next hill because we're not interested in handing the next generation a a clean, well-preserved, still in the package, nothing ventured, nothing gained kind of church or faith. We want to stand before our king one day and receive the well-done, good and faithful servant that comes not from hiding the gospel in a napkin or burying it in the ground to hand it back to God unrisked and well-preserved, not by playing it safe or staying within the lines, but because we took our shot, because we risked everything, investing all we had in returning a worthy return of investment on the one and only life that God gave us. To become the kind of community that our friend Greg Paul described as instead of spending most of our time and resources on a razzle-dazzle Sunday morning service, together we'd heal the sick, feed the hungry, embrace the unwelcome, set prisoners free, restore the dignity of people who've been humiliated, flip the tables of oppressive economics, offer forgiveness instead of seeking vengeance, sacrifice rather than protecting ourselves, and much, much more. And as an aside, if that vision for the church excites you, I want to encourage you to go four for four the next four Sundays as we launch into our annual Hope Live series. It's going to be great. But as we wrap up this series and our time together, we need to appreciate that living with a Jesus-centered worldview means aiming everything we are at Jesus-centered spiritual progress, being fruitful in our faith, multiplying the mission of God, Resisting static and motionless faith and instead joining the movement towards the bullseye, Jesus. Together we can bend the arc of history towards life, love, and justice. Remembering that the church is God's plan A for the world and there is no plan B. So let me ask you again, is the world around us getting better or worse? I suspect that the answer to the question depends entirely on how we respond. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this whole journey that we've been on and for the invitation to come and build our lives on you. Jesus, help us to have the courage to overcome our fears, to even be willing to take great risks, to be able to become more Christ-centered and Christ-like in our lives and as a church. Would you do this great work in us? We need you so desperately, God. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but as we've been journeying through this Bullseye series together, I've been inspired and I've been challenged in asking what it looks like to grow in a more Christ-like way. I hope that you've had similar experiences. And the truth is, if we're going to be doing that together and as a community, then we need to be transformed by the power of Christ in us. One of the ways that we can do that and experience that is through the practice of communion. And so we're going to sing this next song that's going to focus us us on Jesus. I invite you to take the elements that you've gathered uh, and at some point during the song to participate and to take and eat and drink as together we seek to become more Christ-like. The king of my heart be the wind and 
never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down You're never gonna let You're never gonna let me down Sing it out We are a community of imperfect people who desire to put into practice the good news that we preach. Our faith is not about an hour of watching or attending. It's about a lifestyle of full devotion to Christ. Not just a something to believe in, but someone to follow. We don't want to talk a good game on Sunday only to remain unaffected or ineffective for the rest of the week. So while we gather each week to sing, pray, listen, and learn, we know that an hour a week will never produce the life change that we so desperately need. It requires a daily investment of time and training. It takes practice. And practice. And more practice. And when we mess up, we forgive ourselves and each other. Then help each other up and keep practicing. As we go now, into the rest of our week. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. May the Spirit of God fill us to make us kind and compassionate, honest and humble, generous and hospitable, those who repay evil with good, respond to injustice with action, overcoming despair with hope. Let us be known, not by what we're against, but by what and who we are for. And most of all, let us love one another because God is love. It's been good to be together, but now it's time for us to go. In the name of the Father, who loves us unconditionally. In the name of the Son, who restores our true humanity. And in the name of the Spirit, who empowers us to live life to the full. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us today. We hope you felt inspired and challenged by our time together. Now, we know that for what we've heard today to become reality in our daily lives, it's going to take more than just a one hour a week time that we spend together. It requires a moment by moment, seven days a week commitment to practice the way of Jesus and the way of peace. That's why we provide a host of ways to continue to lean into God's presence while we're away from each other. As always, you can click the Practice This Week button below the player for daily spiritual exercises to continue to develop those muscles we started building today. If it helps, you can also opt into our spiritual practices notifications on our app to get those helpful reminders every morning as you start your day. As our time together ends, we're going to put some questions up on the screen. If you're watching with others, they can serve as great conversation starters, but they can also be a great way of processing and personalizing what you've heard today on your own. And if you'd like a more personal conversation with someone about anything going on in your life, we invite you to reach out to one of our location pastors who will follow up with you privately. Simply fill out the Connect card, which you can find on our website or on the app. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us, and have a great week.